All right, I am the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome you. Let me welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm the host, I'm your chief cat herder, and your guide to the next hour of conversation about XR and what that means for higher education. Uh, we have a topic that is of great, great interest, especially from a futurist point of view. We all know about virtual reality. We all know about augmented reality. And we're all very curious about how these can play out in terms of higher education, in terms of teaching and learning. And with us, we have two guests who are, for my money, the world's best gurus on how we learn about this and how we apply it to higher education. To begin with, I'd like to welcome my good friend, Maya Gorgieva, and bring her on stage. Hello, Maya. Hi, Brian. It's so nice to be here and see everybody. Um, and I, you know, just curious about XR, I hope. <laughs> I think they are. I think everybody is. And you are just the person to help us learn it. Uh, how are you doing? How is everything? And are you in New York? Yes, I'm in New York City. Um, you know, I spend most of my time these days, um, but uh, it's it's been a good summer and looking forward to reopening our XR lab at the Parsons School of Design and the new school oh, this fall cool. back for our students. And yes, we're working through, um, you know, new protocols and new ways to do that. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, we are very excited um, to welcome back our students, faculty, and, you know, our friends even from the city. Fantastic. Fantastic. And you, you know the drill. I ask people what the, to introduce themselves by describing what they're going to be doing for the next year. And you just started answering that. You started <laughs> describing how you're going to have to reopen your lab for face-to-face -face work. Tell us a bit more about that and also tell us what else are you going to be working on for 2021-2022? Oh, I can't wait um, to, you know, to meet the students um, and uh, we meet them in virtual worlds. And uh, as you know, we've been reading, meeting there and experimenting and it has been like an amazing year um, between collaborating and exploring these places, these new spaces. Um, but at the same time, we're excited um, to also welcome them on site and um, be, you know, for the students to be able to like firsthand touch experience, uh, play the things. Um, that we have in, in our um, Excel lab, so um, that is one. I I my I have also um, sort of like a, a my personal challenge this fall is in addition to everything I do, I will be teaching uh, our foundational course in immersive storytelling at the Parsons School of Design. This is a course that is offered to all of our students. So in it, we have students that come from design backgrounds and very visual and media backgrounds, but we also have. Um, you know, our makers, so to speak. But we also have our thinkers because we also have uh, students that come from anthropology and um, come from um, coding liberal arts or design and journalism in our liberal arts college in Lang. And then also, um, you know, it's so much fun because we get students from our performance college and we get our actors and people who actually play music. Uh, and it brings it brings it brings us full circle. It is something that I've been um, actually co-teaching for the last few years, and you know, kind of bringing students in a different variety. But I get to do it myself this fall. So, oh. as anybody who's faced with um, with a number of students and TAs, um, I'm working hard on on making this happen. Well, that sounds terrific, um, and your enthusiasm is infectious. I can only imagine how excited your students will be. Um, uh, I, friends, I, if you're new to the forum, I have a couple of quick questions uh, for Maya. But then the whole idea is for you all uh, to take the floor, for you all to ask her your questions. Uh, and you can tell already that she's an expert in this. Um, and you can also tell that we're going to have a lot to talk about. Uh, one thing I would like to ask um, is, I mentioned before, we're familiar with augmented reality or AR. And we're all pretty familiar with VR. But what for you, what does XR mean? What does it stand for? And how should we think about it? Yes, XR, extended reality. And it's been an interesting word when we first appeared a few years back. Um, and, you know, as we, we, yeah, there's been research and work being doing in virtual and augmented reality and then XR. And I think what's happening is that as all of us were starting to play and uh, really experiment with VR, AR, 360 video, we kind of get into a place where, you know, you're thinking about, um, well, this, you know, how, how, what are you making? What are you doing? How are you, um, you know, 
kind of how you're focusing, you're teaching, your research, um, you know, your performance. Uh, and so that AXA word became um, in a really the umbrella term. And it was really driven by the idea that things are changing constantly. And so as things are changing, the VR headsets today, they actually can give you a sense of, you know, augmented reality. Um, they have this pass through that you can actually see through your VR headset, your experience. They have a number of sensors similar to what um, mixed reality or augmented reality headsets have. And so this idea that as things continue to evolve, as headsets, as the technology, um, you know, becomes, um, you know, creates new opportunities and affordances, so is our language. And AXA stands for this umbrella term that in mm. kind of really captures that sort of um, that we are on a continuum. And so is the technologies and the things we can make with it. Um, so really an umbrella term, um, you know, that that works. And I know because uh, about four years ago when I titled the AXA Reality Center at the new school, I spent a tour of, of trying to say what's XR. <laughs> so um it's interesting, you know, the the world the word now is used both um, very heavily in industry, but as well as in education. It just really encompassing the work that's taking place in these domains: AR, VR, three hundred and sixty video, MR, mm -hmm. and so so and so on. A fine umbrella term. Thank you. That's really really clear. Uh, friends, uh, this is the uh, time to shift over to a few different things. But one I want to point out to you is the occasion of us hosting uh, Maya and her colleague has to do with the release of a very powerful and important new report from iLearn. Now, this is a report on the state of XR. Now, if you look on the bottom left of your screen, you should see a kind of mustard colored box. Now, if you press that button, up will pop a link to that full report. And this is a report that is very, very powerful, very important, and covers a lot of ground. It used a kind of Delphi method report to uh, approach to work with a whole bunch of experts literally around the world. Uh, and Maya is one of the lead authors on this report. Uh, so just really, really quickly, before we can dive into the, uh, everyone else's get questions, I just wonder, Maya, if you could just say a word or two about the report and uh, what surprised you about it and what we should find in it. Yes. So this has been uh, in our report that, you know, it's been like a year and a half in the making uh, as many efforts, you know, touched and marked by the, you know, the, the, the time we spend in, you know, like basically social distancing in the pandemic. Um, but um, it is, uh, as, as Brian said, is a Delphi method. So it started with um, summoning a, a panel of about um, um, from a hundred and more expert panel, which the IORN network was, you know, the immersive learning network and research network um, was, um, you know, really uh, championed and, and supported um, the entire effort of producing the State of Exile report. And so, um, you know, with them, um, you know, bringing up a panel expert, um, and having discussing and with that kind of discussing in a digital workspace asynchronously and bringing a number of topics um, to, you know, to, you know, it's that that whole movement, virtual augmented mixed reality um, movement and its impact on education and the future of work. And then we were able to like pull these um, the, these um, panel members, and that took us, um, you know, and analyzed some of a lot of the activity that was taking place uh, in the workspace, which actually we, you know, which kind of get us uh, to about thirty four different topics, and then with um, the help of the really of the polling and the survey method, we actually ended up with um, really seventeen main sort of areas, uh, topics of interest. Uh, this was also guided on the three um, research questions, um, you know, the, you know, and they, they kind of very on a high level, these research questions focus on the promises of immersive learning, on the challenges and the, on the catalyst. And for that, you know, that, that kicked off our, our authors, as you know, Brian process. Uh, and I was very, very fortunate to work with you, uh, with Emery Craig, with uh, Jonathan Richter and Mark Lee from Iowa. And so, um, you know, working on these um, and, and kind of really writing sort of these the chat the chapters on each of these research questions um yeah so i think this is in each research questions we highlighted um 
uh, the first one, um, of course, being mine, had seven categories, but all, all to the challenges in the catalyst, uh, challenges written by you, Brian, and catalyst by Emery Craig had six uh, key areas where we felt um, either we need to work more or we, we felt uh, a catalyst for innovation. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I think, friends, you can see what a, what a, a buzzing and, and powerful report this is. Uh, please grab a copy. Uh, and while we have a chance to do so right now, I'd actually like to uh, take advantage of the opportunity to uh, beam up one of the important people who made all this work. Uh, this is a, um, a leader in the field. This is the head of the Immersive Learning Project and the chief organizer of the report, Jonathan Richter. And let's see if we can get him now. Hello, Jonathan. Hey, Brian. Hey, Maya. Hello, everyone. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Where are you today? Where have we found you? Uh, I'm in my office in Missoula, Montana. Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, great. So this is one of the one of the powerful things again about uh, about about the uh, technologies that we're able to easily have people from Montana, New York, and Virginia together at once. Right. John, how what did, what have you seen of the report in the world so far? What kind of feedback and what kind of surprises have you found from it? Well, it's getting it's getting a pretty good reviews um, so far, which we're very thankful for. Um, uh, a number of different teacher educators um, have told us that they're preparing for use of it in the fall in their curricula, um, and we're 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 getting a number of people that are interested in joining um, the next expert panel, uh, as we have a full intention to to do this again and again. Um, oh. So yeah, we've gotten uh, um, several thousand uh, downloads since our early release uh, in the middle of May, and uh, they they keep they keep rolling through every every day. Nice, that's a yeah. lot of reading. That's a lot of people. Um, I would love to uh, I would love to hear more about this. I know you're in a hurry, John. You've got to run, but I want to thank you for uh, organizing the report. Um, and I'll, I'll keep you on stage as long as I can, or I'll keep you involved. <laughs> But for everyone, yeah, well, um, you know, one of the things that we're that Maya and I've been really talking about um, lately is the potential for us to do sort of persistent environmental scanning um, and and really engage the network, other futurists like yourself, um, to to really you know kind of keep that searchlight, uh, the eye of Sauron on <laughs> on, the, on the horizon, uh, to because this this space of XR of immersive learning is just constantly emerging and it really requires, um, you know, I, I think a, a number of eyes looking and translating the yeah. different uh, possible uses and these new technologies to figure out just how uh, well uh, we might be able to utilize these across, across the globe. Um, if anybody here wants to participate in this Eye of Sauron project going forward, <laughs> Uh, what's the, what's the best way for them to find you? Is it uh, from the immersive learning site? Uh, yeah, go to the immersivelrn.org uh, website, uh, or you can uh, get a hold of Maya or myself um, at our respective names at immersivelrn.org. Very good, very good. Yeah. Um, well, I, I know you have to go, so I should actually gently urge you off the edge of the balcony here uh, and and give you a chance to, to run. But we'll, we'll pick right. on you as long as, as long as you can be. And thank you again for all of this. And for anybody Absolutely. else. Yeah, my wife's waiting to head. We're headed to a um, Red Ants Pants. It's a country, alt country music festival in the middle of nowhere, Montana. So we're, we're all set up and ready to go. But I really wanted to say hey to everybody and, and thank you for tuning in. And, and thank you, Maya and Brian, for all your incredible work. Well, hit the road and uh, enjoy. And thank you again for all of this. And uh, I'll just put a link to this for everybody else. Uh, if you if you haven't seen this, here's the uh, uh, here's a link to the uh, website. If you'd like to join uh, the next uh, report, if you'd like to get a sense of how it works, please uh, please feel free to. Uh, and now we have time for questions from everybody. Uh, and already we've got a question just right here, ready to go. Uh, and this comes from uh, Andrew Peterson at Ferris State, who asks, "Does XR replace any classroom time?" Interesting question, Andrew. All right. So, um, so this is an interesting question, and we we actually um, live in an interesting time, right? We 
we uh, had this pandemic where we, we very actively, a lot of us were experimented. And indeed, uh, we went to this virtual world as a place where we can meet, we can collaborate, we can create and make. Um, that said, um, usually when I approach it, I look for the opportunities. Um, right, there's as much time you can spend in a VR headset today. Most of the time, when I'm in my lab, whether it's research or I work um, with with anybody on my team, including students, um, I kind of keep it to 20 minutes max. So um, really, it's it's a just a you know unofficial rule. I'd like people to take a break. Um, it is still, you know, the headset are, headsets are improving, but it still has impact. You know, it's kind of your eyes may get strained. We have all different sensitivities, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, sitting with a headset, so um, um, and um, so this is just an official rule I do. But what it's really good at is actually finding an opportunity. For example, in the STEM, in the sciences, right? We have just uh, a very interesting way to uh, observe science phenomena, to be actually very close up and personal to science phenomena. It's very interesting also to do research on a number of science phenomena in virtual reality. Mm. And so those tend to be, you know, experiences. Um, we call them experiences because they're not movies, right? Because you you are part of them, right? And that's why I really, I really, that for me is very important sort of difference between anything you do on the screen. Um, and so those could be, you know, those could run you to different um, science phenomena and, you know, can um, ways to interact with them. It could be akin to what we oftentimes think about a simulation. It could take on a more narrative form. So all of these, but sometimes these, these are very good um, in uh, where we can address uh, a particular opportunity with VR and then bring this, whether it's in a discussion forum like this one, or mm -hmm. bring this to the classroom and the questions get exponentially better because um we actually uh, it's very you know i can explain to you virtual reality today but it's the moment when you put on the headset and the moment actually after you take the headset when the aha moment appear and um you know i just feel like i've been fortunate one of the things of getting thousands and people and students and that's when like you actually realize the potential of this but i do still see the opportunity in finding a key area whether it's in the medical science or you know social like social sciences or even sort of uh narrative um you know uh, education to, to basically take us to places we can go, go and then come back and, and think. And then at some point in the future, this will be very much a our, our meeting space. Um, it will, you know, we are very much headed to this uh, learning and we already see it even in workforce in, you know, some opportunities where, you know, workforce training is now starting to take place in XR. Um, so um, that's, that's my kind of answer that, um, that we have a, a really interesting opportunities, but today it's probably in in the the, the power is in making very key and targeted, um, uh, you know, take advantage of these key and targeted learning opportunities. Very targeted, very focused on a particular issue and limited in time. And uh, Andrew, what a great question to ask that really, really pinned it down. Thank you. Uh, Maya, what a great answer. It shows how deep this is. Um, and And... The future aspect we're going to circle back to, I promise. Um, we have a few more questions. And by the way, overall, uh, we had some chat about people having a hard time trying to get to the website. Uh, it looks like the website just reloaded, and you should be able to get it right now. Um, so if you're still having issues, just uh, reload the page, and you should be able to get to it right now. Uh, we have a question from um, uh, John Fitzgibbon at Boston College, who narrows this down to a precise point. He asks, what do you see as the role of augmented reality? in higher ed. Yes. All right. Well, um, so this there is still, um, you know, this perception, and it really is a perception that virtual reality is about, belongs to, to the game, you know, the gamers, the simulations, maybe mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. in some of these areas. And also there is, um, and I face it every day, questions about, well, what impact does it have on us? What impact does it have on, for example, younger children? Um, and so augmented reality in this case, you know, is, is something that um, I think teachers, I think parents, I think all of us uh, gravitate towards it because it, it, it really is, you know, with augmented reality, you put on glasses, so you're still very much in your physical world uh, and you're just bringing that extra digital um, layer. Uh, again, you know, you, you can, you know, similarly take some of the advantages of, of bringing, um, you know, interesting digital assets, um, immersiveness narrative to, to that space. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it also, like with some, you know, apps, very importantly, offers opportunity for students, even younger students, to create, and that's very powerful for students to be able to be engaged and create augmented reality experiences. So, uh, certainly, I see a range of possibilities, um, and uh, really, with it, it does have a little bit of ease in terms of um, just purely of, I think, on the on the level of, um, you know, how perception, how we perceive things. Um, and um, that that is um, what I think why uh, I think in particularly in, with younger children it is a much more adapted medium. Um, hmm. So I think that's um, that's sort of the short answer. It offers I think immense um, it, you know opportunities, and I do think that we will be. I think the future is much more mixed. Um, the future will be something where perhaps um, you know the headset or the uh, the glassware, whatever we mm -hmm. uh, we uh, we have, would be actually able to switch between you know how much you see from the physical world um, and sort of uh, that digital layer is kind of how close to you and immersive, and so you might be very much you know immersed in a fully virtual world in in some moments and in some moments letting some of that light and the physical world come in. Um, I. I I think that it's we probably will live much more not so distinct as we live in today AR VR, but much more much more in that sort of mixed um, you know reality place. Yeah. Um, a continuum. Yeah, John, that was a great question. Thank you, um, and uh, Maya just really really lays this open for just how many ways this could work. We have more questions coming in, uh, and one is from a colleague of mine at Georgetown. Uh, let me just bring her question up because this is a good one. And I might ask her a question to follow up. Uh, Beth asks, can you recommend AR development tools that are relatively easy to learn and use for faculty and students that don't have programming experience? Yes. Okay. So, um, I mean, there's been a couple of tools quite heavily adopted in education, Blipper and Zapper, and a steady, you know, a steady amount of work in both K through 12 and higher education mm -hmm. um, has taken place. You know, more recently, um, we, uh, and they both have educational sort of component to them. Um, they also have a visual interface, meaning that they don't, they, they could, uh, you could enter more coding environments, but you can be stay into kind of more um, in the environment um, that are uh, very much a visual interface. Um, Adobe Aero has come on, you know, kind of in the last uh, year, still, uh, you know, in kind of beta, a bit buggy, but um, not sure. Adobe is kind of like uh, with their suite of tools, they, they, it's coming along. Um, it's a, also a place, of course, Ado like, you know, it's still, th that means access to um, a number of different Adobe tools. Um, there's been, um, <clears throat> With some of the, you know, sort of, if you are more on the, um, on the, you know, sort of uh, with the younger generation, we also have, uh, you know, and, um, you know, younger students, uh, we've also used this jigsaw, like sort of um, um, workshop sort of app has been transforming in a number of different ways. Um, and so these are, these are really some, some of the products that um, I think a number of teachers um, have, have gone and have some good experience um, trying things out. But I have to say, you know, going into any of those tools, you have to understand how, how you know, how they're changing constantly uh, and uh, really uh, embrace that, <laughs> embrace that with it. Uh, and being able to kind of bring the students along, but really uh, things are changing. Like, for example, last year we started in September with uh, with a, a ways Adobe Aero was working in through the semester. They released uh, several different versions 
Um, and so that that's kind of the thing, how things are happening. Well, that's a that's a big landscape and a fluid landscape. That's evolving very quickly. Uh, Beth helps run the uh, wonderful Gillardin Center for New Media at Georgetown, which is a terrific, terrific resource for everyone in that community. So I just want to give a shout out for that. Uh, we also have the wonderful Barrington Baines from uh, Gillardin, who does great work with VR and 360 video. Uh, so I just want to shout out to them, as to Barrington as well. Uh, we have a couple of questions and responses in the chat, Maya. Uh, uh, one is uh, John Fitzgibbon says that yes. reality composer is the way to go. Yes, it is definitely, it's a good tool. Uh, here's my my pause on that. Um, and, and, you know, it's the same thing with Adobe Aero actually brings me down. Yeah is yeah. that it's a it's an apple only tool um yeah, and uh, we walk into classrooms that obviously students come with different devices but uh yes um i do um i i you know we you know i think it should be explored and you know where students um you know where the projects sort of is much more open um and because ac access and accessibility is important you know some students can definitely leverage it um i had to make sometimes decisions in terms of how many times I teach AR in an effort to open it to everybody in the classroom. And that's, that brings us to some of the things we outlined in the report, like access and you know, uh, interoperability and a number of these key areas. But um, yes, so we have to be mindful. That's a real issue, the silos are there. And they, I wrote about that in the report myself. John, good question or good observation to, uh, to mention. We have more questions that are just coming in all over the place. Um, and Brent, I didn't know you were in Armenia. Fantastic. Great to hear from you. Please uh, uh, let, the, uh, let the kids sleep. Uh, Brent asked a question, uh, which is, he says, I've been claiming that this is the breakout year for VR headsets since 2019. What do you think there will, when do you think there will be real mainstream acceptance and usage? I think that I, I do believe we are on a journey with this. Right. Um, and I do think that this last year has opened the space for a number of people from both uh, academia and industry. Um, but I really think about this as uh, as a moment of uh, when a, a lot more people will be able to create in, in this domain. Um, and I think because you just look at two and they, I rarely do that as you know, I'm very uh, when I come to, to technology, I really, um, really kind of feel like in, with Excel, we need to look into older and other technology. If anything, I, I discourage that, as, as you know, Brian. But, you know, just look into what happened uh, with video once actually everybody had a camera um, in, in their pocket or in, you know, affordability to even even before it became, you know, on all of our iPhones, but, you know, something that a whole lot of people can were able to afford and then share into various other social platforms. Mm -hmm. I think this is when I think there is this moment of, um, of, of real breakthrough. And I think in XR, we don't have to look into everybody has to have a headset, but I think we, we will probably go through the AR route because augmented reality glasses are going to become a reality. They are already, they, you know, there are obviously pairs. There's just not a big ecosystem. There's not a, a you know, a big um, sort of movement behind them. But I do believe that we're very close in two to three years and, and them becoming fairly affordable, lots of different, um, you know, application being written, you know, made available, and as as that like adoption to to actually make it make use in everyday life, and I think that's that's sort of that's the moment where I feel like we'll be there. Yeah. Brent, quick question, good question, um, and Maya, thank you for that very balanced and uh, experienced answer. Um, I hope so. I hope so. We we have more questions piling up though. I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask. We have one coming from uh, Franny Gaeta at the uh, University of Oregon, uh, who asks, can you reflect a bit on XR as scholarship and preservation oh. of the scholarly record? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Franny, for this question. So there are a couple of different ways to approach that. Uh, one is, uh, and I'm going to kind of very quickly, you know, provide an experience, like, uh, for example, at the new school, uh, we have obviously, uh, you know, Parsons School of Design, and as such, we have donated a number of artifacts, which is our sort of 
study collection for students like you can go to which a museum quality so you can go to a museum but everything is kind of away from you but when it's a study collection you can go and touch and see how they're made and so we have a, now a very big study collection of artifacts donated from museum quality alumni designers etc and so in some respect and so we one of my first uh, experiences uh, was actually to create a virtual reality library and we just did a prototype of that just you know, we have thousands of those. Um, hmm. But the idea that, you know, then something that, you know, is sitting uh, somewhere in a catalog and then once you digitize it, is available to students, alumni, potentially others across the world. And then, so this is a very, this is one of the ways, you know, when you think about preservation, it is introducing a really a lot of questions, right? Um, because some of these are, these are tangible, like artifacts, they're made of fabric, they're made of, you know, materiality to them. Um, and, but also we're making them today, um, which is sort of the, you know, one thing is how you, pre you know, you have the opportunity to preserve things that you've never been able to. But on the other hand, you also are thinking about, well, how do we actually make sure that this is going to run in 20, I don't know, 25 even. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're thinking about like, uh, you know, how do you catalog all of these assets? How do you ensure that actually um, if they're digitized today, they will continue to serve in the future? So this is one area, but the other area in terms of scholarship um, and uh, of, you know, making, like a lot of things are taking, I, I just gave you an example in what's happening at the new school in Parsons, but I know Colleen across the country, a similarly, you know, um, having, you know, experiences in STEM, in sciences, in medical education, across, uh, you know, journalism, uh, media studies. Uh, and so we, we actually, everybody's kind of keeping them on some, you know, it's, it's, it, there's not been a good actually way to share at the moment and keep. And um, I'm very concerned about that because um, I have been involved in kind of like actually some ex early on in my work, through my work and experiences of bringing back videos from the 50s and 70s. And this is a challenge today, 50 year, you know, like 60, 70 years later, it's a huge challenge to bring those, this early move, you know, just not even early, but, you know, almost like mid-century movies to, to, to be a part of the cultural and, and you know, sort of um, research and, and educational. So I think it's a big question um, in that, you know, how uh, how we preserve that. And there's no uh, easy answer because we are so early. Um, you know, things that are more like research that is written research, it's still text, is, we know what to do with text. Right. Uh, we just, you know, the the areas we work with, um, the kind of headsets and, and experience, uh, it's it changes constantly. Well, thank you for that searching, uh, realistic, embracing answer. And and Franny, uh, thank you for a really really important question. Um, good luck, and we'd love to hear your thoughts uh, as the director of digital scholarship services. We we have a couple more questions on the uh, production side of XR. Uh, now I'll bring these together. Uh, this is one from Devin Scarrett from Southern New Hampshire. Uh, and Devin asks, what progress has been made in creating XR design and publishing tools to make it easy for non-technical educators uh -huh. with the opportunity to use to make XR experiences? So that kind of builds on our, our, our AR discussion a few minutes ago. Right. So um, thank you, Devin. Um, very good question. And one that I also feel very, very much dear to me. Um, as, as, as I mentioned, like, you know, students as creators is one of my key areas, like some of the things I work day every day at the new school. So I think um, uh, I think we are uh, actually having access to some of the AI experience, some of the AI applications are coming in. 360 video is very approachable. The 360 mm -hmm. cameras today have gone down in price like, um, and we get 8, 8K quality out of them, which uh, none of us, how many of us are actually looking at 8K? And wow. you know, these these things are, um, these cameras that are less than $500 can do that. So it's very empowering. The tools, um, you know, exist for 360 edit, a number of tools exist for 360 editing. Of course, we need to actually um, be very much thinking about, you know, how we introduce this to students and um, to that point of how we introduce um, these tools, design principles. Um, there's a body that is starting to emerge in terms of sharing this, both in terms of um, curriculum and more practical approaches. Um, and um, 
uh, you know, how we do that. The tools themselves, um, you know, something like uh, Unity has, um, you know, which is, you know, oftentimes when you say Unity, people think um, very, you know, advanced coding. Um, mm -hmm. It in, Indeed, it is an industry standard. It's a, it's a very, very deep software. It's a very, and it takes time. It takes time even for students that have invested already and have, you know, a background in media to, um, to become comfortable with it. That's the truth. Like I, I, you know, I introduce this daily to, to different groups. So um, obviously, but then they have created some plugins that are very easy for younger generation to create like a very quick simulations and games. And so I think it's a, it's, which is very empowering to see. So um, yes, there is definitely an industry standard tools that are very high and not as accessible. And that's, we see that in medical, we see that in architecture, for example, and some of these, these areas. But on the other hand, we see tools that, um, you know, like mobile application, we see things that you can run 360 editing tools that are becoming available, you know, that you can add, you don't need a, a, a big PC or a VR ready PC, as we used to say. Um, you know, Unity and Real both free for education, but you need the right team to introduce it to students. And um, I definitely think that's uh, that's something that uh, is still um, we in higher education don't I, I don't have the teams ready. Um, I, I talk to educators from across the country and and teams in in my in in similar positions, and I often think this has become like somebody's third or fourth job uh, to introduce Exa. Mm -hmm. And I think the institutions mm -hmm. and the places where there's a very much a an effort in bringing those along, and there's a team behind them uh, are doing much better in understanding the landscape, understanding the opportunities with different tools, introducing them to both students and faculty. Um, it is a um, very different approach uh, in terms of both curriculum development and content development. Uh, and those are all like uh, a seminar or a workshop of its own. Well, it sounds like, I mean, there's, there's a lot going in there. Uh, and one of them is that a lot of this is team-based. Uh, you need to have multiple, you know, you need to have a squad uh, working on this. Is that, is that what we should be thinking about, that it's a, it's a collaborative team-based project to build stuff in XR and education? Oh, absolutely. And I think that one of the things, um, this is not a curriculum designer and a, and a faculty. I think that's, that's often, uh, I think, some of the um, where things slow down. And I, I'm often asked, what are the pitfalls? Why, you know, why is, you know, the, why is there not as much progress? It is a lack of teams. It is a lack of expertise. It is a lack of knowledge that um, we, we don't have readily in the house. It's not just an education. It's frankly, in many industries, but we need to build those because you need, you need people that will be, you know, producers and um, will be thinking about the narratives and will think about the user interface and the user interaction and the um, user experience. And, and, and at some, we do have some instructional designers who have spent time in it, but we have a lot of instructional designers that come from a much, a much more area of, you know, pedagogical sort of learning area um, that takes a whole new kind of uh, reset once you go to immersive. Um, a lot of a lot of a lot of us in academia, you know, for two decades, who have been working with video, and we're very very good with video. And one of the things is, right, this works in video should work in VR. No, actually, you need these other people to come on the table, but the developers, um, you know, uh, user interaction, you are like all these uh, narrative, you know, all of the above to be at the table with the faculty and um, really being able to to kind of like. Be very much collaborative effort. Thank you. That's a that's that's a really important takeaway from this, uh, and I think some of the participants here uh, are actually playing that kind of role. Uh, I see people from the University of Michigan, for example, uh, who I think play that kind of role of uh, of creating stuff, creating VR content for higher education as part of a team. Uh, in the chat, we had a couple of really good observations. Uh, Brent followed up by recommending uh, notes on blindness. A VR application that gives one an experience of what it's like to be blind. Uh, and Franny followed up by saying, since this is early in creating uh, XR, this is a great time to be thinking about preservation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and Bobby adds that she loves the idea of a VR library. The uh, New York Times VR has a great piece of experience of being in a Syrian refugee camp 
And you can think of one that's ADHD that's also great. Um, that's really, really good. Uh, friends, we're, we're coming to the last 10 minutes of the program. I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to share their thoughts and to ask their questions. And they're just coming thick and fast right now. Uh, and we've got one um, from uh, Victor Viegas, uh, also at Oregon State, who has a, a policy question. Ah. There are some ways to make XR ADA compliant. And if you're not from the U.S., that's the Americans with Disabilities Act. This is a question about accessibility. So, right. So the good part is that we're having more groups thinking about that. Um, first, I, there are, the, you know, just there are communities um, from different um, communities that are coming from, commu you know, again, a community particularly able gamers, um, you know, sort of these oh. very ability projects that have looked into enabling um, um, different other technology and now are looking into XR. So there are also um, several, um, you know, several other groups uh, looking into uh, creating a portfolio of design principles and then can be implemented by developers or educate, you know, like, you know, people um, who are building XR experiences. Now, this is starting to come along. And in the last year, we've seen more of this, which is the good news. Um, the not so good news is that we're still addressing those um, one thing at a time, right? And we are looking for opportunities. For example, there's been one of the early things that you know I saw people were able to do is that it's a most of VR experiences I experienced st best standing, although you could be in a chair. But there wasn't a particular, there wasn't very well. Many of them were not taught of, taught about in terms of uh, what if um, the participant, um, you know, the, is is in a wheelchair. So this became one of the early things that um, you know people can do in terms of adjusting the height and being able to do that. And you know today we have some solutions. And when we started, this was this was like, all right, I'm in a wheelchair and, and everything is running like two feet above me. Mm -hmm. um, so so there's been um, there's been some things that uh, other explorations by, by Microsoft and um, you know Google and Facebook by different addressing some of it. But we don't. We really, and I, I want to be honest because I want more people to work in that. Um, we don't have um, like solution for all different sort of uh, needs that you know we see students coming into us. So what has been happening is defaulting is to using narratives describing things. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if if your disability is however there, there's there's a wonderful opportunity which i saw firsthand like about two years ago there was a student in my class with speech um particularly speech difficulties mm -hmm. and while this was very difficult for him to participate in a traditional classroom setting when we actually transitioned in a virtual world it was a whole nother place right because we had other different uh, ways to communicate there um and he stood up um one of the moments that you know you have these moments when you introduce something like this he stood up after the session and in just push himself through it to express that even though like it you know and it was a very touching moment so there are, we don't have a solution we don't have an answer for everything but really we have a lot of opportunities to explore and more people should should enter that and work on that agreed agreed and uh, I, I think this, it's a great question to ask uh, I'm really glad that you raised this um, because uh, this is going to be an issue that's going to play out in all kinds of ways, including justice, social justice, uh, as well as the practical legalities uh, of all of this. Uh, we, we are at the, at the part of the session where we tend to focus more on the future uh, and we try and push things that way. And I'd like to invite questions about the future of XR, especially if you're thinking about, say, the far future of like 2023. Um, but to, to begin with, while I'm waiting for questions, I want to ask you one, which is, you mentioned that we might be heading towards a kind of XR future. Um, and I've talked with you and Emery about this before in the past. Uh, is it that we may see some form of XR as a kind of default computational paradigm uh, for us going forward? So we set aside the laptops and desktops and instead spend more time with headsets and spectacles? I mean, where, does, where does this take us um, in a few years? I think it will be a few more years. <laughs> I don't think it's it's coming as fast. I think it it will be starting to to get more. I think it's access. We'll be getting more access to to these devices. I do think AR 
will be very, very powerful in that way. But I think there will be room for fully immersive experiences. Um, and I, you know, even today, like I think the best part of doing VR is when you create VR in VR. And I know there's that's that's something um, I think is going to happen, and we are, we're going to play and live and work um, and collaborate and share in these virtual worlds. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, how exactly? Um, that plays out, I think will be very different. I do. And I think, you know, beyond the access point, which I think will sadly plague us for some time, uh, because this all runs on a, in a really, in a, in a good, you know, machines and a good high quality bandwidth. And uh, these things are challenged. There's a whole, you know, not the digital divide can, you know, introduced can be introduced um, in triple and multiple ways with this technology, and we really have to think about that. But I do think that as as a platform, we'll be able to um, to to think and and simulate um, in prototype, um, you know, questions um, and find solutions in ways that we're not able to do on the desktop, and much more powerful. And with that power. Um, yes, um, I will be using the um, the very you know often quoted um, Spider Man, but with that power comes a huge responsibility, and it's true. Like um, I think that's um, that's where we had it. I do believe that this will be a these platforms will um, exist, will continue to evolve, will mature. And I do think that we'll be making choices to spend time with them. How we make those choices. Um, is up to us. It's a real early. I think that one of the things people often think VR has been around, yeah. um, but we're very, very early. Uh, and and mm -hmm. you know when you think about from um, sort of the breakout of, of a technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this may be one that just has a much longer development curve. Um, but we will exist there. We will inhabit avatars. Our avatars will be an extension of ourselves. We will meet virtual beings and they'll have profound impact on us. They will know us better than our friends know us because they will know everything about us. Our digital footprint will be you know, driven by algorithms. I don't want to even open the ethical questions and you know, Emery should be here for that. And um, you know, Hugh, like a lot of work in the last, that I've been doing in the last, uh, real ear has been around the ethical questions. Um, so uh, yes, I think the the point and being here and having this conversation is great because we need more people to be thinking about it, to be raising questions about it, to be uh, working at it and understanding um, that this will have a profound impact on humanity. And this and all the other things, this does, it's not in a vacuum. So yes, AI, um, everything that else that's happening uh, in the world, like like a pandemic and other things, um, we all play into that. That's a bracing vision uh, and a bold vision. And one of the many reasons I wanted to make sure that you could come here to the forum again. Um, let me let me bring that a bit closer to earth in a particular way, um, uh, which is, what does the Future Trends Forum look like in XR? You know, say two years from now, three years from now, how is it different? And I, I'm not just asking that to be uh, self-interested, of course I am, but we have, we've had questions and comments along the way where people have asked about this uh, as XR as a way of hosting classes and as well as holding meetings. Well, I'm, I'm curious, I mean, do we, do we get to uh, replace me with a, a very carefully curated algorithm, uh, a virtual being, or do we have we have multiple uh, avatars that sit around a virtual environment that is different than the one we're experiencing now. Help us, help us envision that. So I will always say that I would rather meet you in person any day, preferably over lunch or some meal, because it's always fun to share stories. So I that will be that will be my preferred you know method or like for some time. But I do want to share something on that, that, you know, we, as, as I work with students and, and people on my team, uh, and very early on, uh, we have been experimenting quite a lot with mixed reality. So immediately, I think month, as we get home, one of the things I was doing is making sure that all our headsets get into somewhere, get into students, because I didn't want them to sit in, in the lab. And so my team, you know, got a, a fair amount of 
of things that we can experiment. And I remember um, just being like two weeks in and it felt like these three first three weeks felt longer than any, you know, we felt that, you know, this was, this was a very different, you know, way we live in. But I remember being about, you know, really early on, like probably in the first month after we were sent home, uh, so to speak. And I um, had, um, you know, we kind of, me and my uh, very, you know, close, uh, you know, somebody from my team, we worked together and collaborate. Um, and uh, we use sort of uh, the magic leap and uh, we have a way to share, like there's several spatial and other, ex other experiences. And um, he beamed right into my living room. Uh, in an avatar form, but I remember sort of the moment that we actually kind of were together again in the same space, um, you know, sharing, um, you know, our space and me saying, no, 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 you can't go there. That's, that's my living room. <laughs> that's, that's my study. Like, come this way. This is where the, the, the area is. Right. Um, and at the same time, like, uh, you know, we seeing each other in our respective spaces. It was really a moment of joy. And I remember Tomas and I just like not, you know, spending more and more time just because that was the only the connection of being embodied uh, in your living, you know, somebody who, you know, you know, well, and you talk and you work together yeah. and to be beamed right in your living room. It's it's very powerful, many times more powerful than Zoom and, and this. so the future of you know, the future trans forum um, will be me, you, and, you know, others being able to share the same space. Uh, and just, it's, 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 it's incredibly, I think, emotional. Uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a very, you know, it's a very big sort of pool and it's, it's very exciting and it becomes much more, it becomes very, very real. Well, it becomes very real in part thanks to the work of you, Maya, and uh, everybody else working with you. I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, it's it's the end of the hour, and I'm I'm just caught up with this vision of appearing in everybody's living rooms, uh, and all of you joining me here in my study. Uh, I think that would be fantastic. Um, now, Maya, the the best way to keep up with you, I think, is to follow the DigitalBodies.net website and to follow you on Twitter, right? Yes, I mean, and LinkedIn. I do, I do, um, yeah, I do um, kind of like try to stay up to date, uh, at least um, in being able to share, uh, you know, where I may, you may meet me and, and certainly always uh, interested to hear your stories and what you're working on in your institutions with your colleagues and uh, mm -hmm. uh, really an opportunity to collaborate, I would say. Uh, I am in New York City, and we love, love visitors, but, uh, you know, the times are a little bit different, but hopefully in some near future, you'll get to come and visit us at the Parsons School of Design at the new school. As we can. Well, thank you so much, Maya. You've been a fantastic guest. Thank you for a very practical yet visionary look into XR. Uh, everybody else, please keep an eye on, on Maya and her colleague, Emery, and uh, our friend, Jonathan Richter, for all of their work in this. Um, thank you so much. But don't go away yet. Don't go away yet because we have to talk about what's happening next on the Future Trends Forum. Uh, so, and again, let me thank everybody for really, really good questions on this. Um, so looking ahead, we have sessions on digital reading, improving equity for black students, the educated underclass, academic mergers, open access and scholarly publication and rethinking teaching. So just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to learn more about that. If you want to keep talking about these questions, like what does it mean to structure an academic team to build something in higher ed with XR, just use the hashtag FTTE, especially on Twitter. You can tweet at me, at Brian Alexander. Now, if you want to go back into the past and look at some of our other sessions on XR, just go to tinyworld.com slash FTF archive. And alongside those sessions, you can find sessions on everything, including accessibility and scholarly publication. Now, thank you all for a great conversation. We're gonna upload this shortly to uh, YouTube so you'll be able to access it later on. Thank you all for contributing your stories, your thoughts from multiple continents and nations. I hope all of you take care and stay safe this summer as you work on preparing for the fall. And above all, please keep talking about us. Keep to, please keep talking with us. We wanna have this conversation going. We'll see you online. Take care, bye-bye. <laughs>